First things first, we're going to talk about is we're looking at GLP-1 specifically and how to maintain muscle while on them. They're obviously the hottest cra craze right now. The incretin mimetic drugs are IMDs. Essentially, these are drugs like semaglutide and terzepatide, and they're used for obesity and diabetes. What they mean by incretin, so incretin hormones are things like glucagon-like peptide 1 or GLP-1 and gastric inhibitory peptide or GIP. And these incretin mimetics, they stimulate insulin release, they slow gastric emptying, and suppress the appetite. And that's kind of how they work. And this has been rapidly adopted by everyone in medicine. It's crazy. I would say before, you know, just a couple months ago, maybe a year or so ago, I rarely prescribed a weight loss medication. And then over the last year, year and a half, things have just blown up. And it's probably the most asked about medication in my clinic. Everyone is talking about these days. So I just wanted to talk about it a little bit here. And they've been rapidly adopted, meaning everyone's prescribing them like crazy. You know, there's not enough of them. People can't get them in the stores at the pharmacies. They can't get them because they're out. And they've been all over the place used by everybody, but it's kind of outpaced the ability for professional societies to update their clinical guidelines. And so we're kind of getting out there on a limb and people are just doing things and we're figuring all it together. And so that's what we're trying to figure out here is, hey, how can we use best practices, learn from here? So essentially the idea of this paper was to explore the muscle loss though, specifically that was associated with rapid weight loss caused by these IMDs and then propose strategies to minimize muscle loss. And the reason we care so much is because muscle is important, right? We, if you lose muscle, you're losing muscle mass and it's losing function and can lead to negative health outcomes like reduced metabolic health, weight regain, and a compromised quality of life. So this is why we care so much about it. And low muscle mass often is unrecognized and usually independently associated with increased risk of mortality and morbidity, reduced quality of life, increased risk of type 2 diabetes, and other health outcomes. And so in and of itself, low muscle mass is associated with bad outcomes. So that's why we care so much because if we are taking these medications and we lose weight, that's cool. But if we lose a lot of muscle mass, that may lead to a lot of other issues as well. And so that's what we're kind of looking at here. We want to talk about what's the actual mechanisms, right? So these IMDs, these you know, GLP-1 drugs and other, other medications, they help uh, with weight loss by reducing appetite and slowing gastric emptying, emptying as well. But muscle loss is a consequence of caloric restriction, right? And so that's the big thing is there it's going to happen when you lose weight, whether it's through exercise or nutrition or bariatric surgery or these medications, you will lose muscle. That's just how it goes because you're in a caloric deficit. Um, specifically, you know, I would say there's very rare circumstances where it lose a little bit. Maybe some people are able to hold on to all of it, but odds are you're going to lose some muscle. The question is how much? That's the million dollar question. And specifically on this slide here, there's a nice photo and explains there's multiple reasons for muscle loss. Um, not things necessarily do only to these medications, but also associated with them. So things like aging, as you age, you tend to have less muscle mass. That's what happens. Um, if you have pre-existing low muscle mass, obviously that plays a role. Comorbidities like type 2 diabetes, a history of weight recycling, meaning, hey, you consistently gain weight, lose it, all that stuff. Inadequate protein intake may play a factor as well. Reduced appetite from these medications, GI side effects, and then physical inactivity, which can sometimes all be associated. So it's much more complicated than just like, hey, you take the medication and you lose muscle. There's lots of things going on as well. But it is something that we have seen and, and that's why we're worried about it. And specifically looking at this, this step one trial, um, the surmount trial, what they had here is they essentially had, this is a trial of semiglutide and terzepatide. This was a clinical trial and these, and these participants lost 10% or more of their muscle mass during this 68 to 72 week treatment, which equates to about 20 years worth of age-related muscle loss. That's what they said. They said, hey, you know, this amount of weight loss is 10% loss in muscle. That is what we expect to see over 20 years of time. So they're saying, hey, in this 68 to 50 or 72 week, like that experiment, they lost as much muscle as they would over the next 20 years just by general aging. And so that's pretty crazy. Then even crazier thing was that overall though, the numbers were consistent with other means of weight loss, things like bariatric surgery. So when we're stepping back, when you're losing enormous amounts of weight, right? You know, looking at 10, 15, 20%, above percent of your total body weight, that's a lot of weight. And, you know, similar to bariatric surgery. And they're finding that the numbers in terms of how much muscle you're losing was similar to those bariatric surgeries. So this isn't necessarily just a GLP-1 thing. This is a rapid weight loss and profound weight loss thing. And the implications for this, though, is that lower muscle mass does reduce metabolic rate. It increases the risk of weight regain, and then also may lead to weight cycling, like we talked about, which is kind of gaining weight, losing it, and going back and forth. And then it may lead to something called sarcopenic obesity, which is where you have essentially lost your muscle mass, but you still have obesity. So if we're just losing a little bit of weight, right? You're just losing some weight and you lose predominantly muscle, like are you in a better metabolic state than when you, before you lost that weight? And, and that question is maybe not. And that's the biggest takeaway here is if you're just losing muscle, that's certainly not good. And here on the slide here, there were there's also another image I just want to talk about that. That is essentially the pattern of weight loss on these meds. It shows that when you're on the medication, life is good. Essentially, that's what it is. You lose weight and things are looking good. But then once you stop, 
we tend to see an increase in their weight and increase with appetite and energy intake. And so it's kind of this, hey, what we're finding here is that when you're on these medications, you kind of got to be on them long term. Obviously, we do not have a long track record of using these for weight loss specifically. And there might be some ideas with cycling it. You go on, you know, for a certain period of time and off again. And we're going to learn a lot more. I guarantee you about that. But it seems like right now when you stop it, we tend to have some weight regain. And so that's another concern of ours as well as being on these forever. What does it have to do with everything? And so what are actually nutritional strategies for muscle maintenance? That's a big thing, right? So how can we do it? You know, when we're on these medications, it's going to start taking off some weight by the mechanisms we already talked about, right? You know, decreased gas emptying, increased satiety, all those things. But how do we hang on to as much muscle as possible? Well, first things first is getting adequate protein. So the big thing is they're recommending about 1.0 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. And it depends on how much to lose. This is a general ballpark, right? Like if you have an enormous amount of weight to lose, if you're, you know, having a BMI over 40, 45, something like that, it may be more to use the ideal body weight because then all of a sudden you're going to be eating 300 plus grams of protein a day, which is excessive and very hard to do and expensive. And so lots of things there. So that's a general ball, you know, ballpark for people who are kind of in the, um, you know, general overweight to let me on the smaller side of obese stage, but like I said, this is not medical advice anyway. So talk with someone if you're doing it, but overall that's like the general goal. So one, 1.5 gram per kilogram of body weight. A lot of times people say, Hey, what you should do is just go for like one gram for your overall weight. Once again, that can be enormous. So I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, but they're saying, Hey, the long story short of this is, Hey, we want you to have adequate protein intake because we're giving your body what it needs to maintain muscles, right? So we need protein to hang on to muscle mass. So that's really important. Protein supplementation or oral nutritional supplements may be required to meet these needs. So some people say, Hey, I just can't stomach eating that much chicken breast or something like that. You might be like, Hey, I can't be as boring as you, Jordan, and eat chicken breast consistently. And that's okay. I realize I am a very boring person and that is my life, but uh, you may need to supplement with protein powders or anything like that. And on top of that, they also mentioned micronutrient intake is may, may need to make sure that's sufficient to support muscle function. They were incredibly vague on this, though. They just pretty much said, yeah, you should uh, take micronutrients in. OK, well, that's super unhelpful. But once again, if we're stepping back, health promoting diet, that's what we're hoping for. Right. We're not just using these medications as a get out of jail free card. Like, hey, I can do whatever I want, eat whatever I want. No, we still want to do it in the context of a health promoting diet being physically active, all that stuff. So if we're having a health promoting diet, hopefully we're getting a micronutrient intake there as well. But that's just something I wanted to mention. And then they mentioned physical activity as well. I want to talk about the physical activity recommendations. And you've probably heard these multiple times on this podcast. So I'm going to go over, over, over them again. Essentially what they're looking at is just resistance training, right? So resistance training and aerobic training. And they mentioned flexibility as well, but uh, not that important. But resistance training, at least a couple of times a week, full body. That's what they're going for, two or three sessions per week, full body, um, using all the main muscle groups. That's a big thing. And, and the, this is like the biggest take home and foot stomp here is the studies have shown that it helps retain muscle during caloric deficits in patients with obesity or after bariatric surgery. So in previous studies where people had a lot of weight loss, resistance training seems to be the key to hang it on to that muscle mass. And so like if you had to prioritize one while losing weight, I would prioritize resistance training. That would be probably it. That being said, we're building lifelong athletes here. And so we should be active and doing all the things here. And so I'd also say, you know, from a physical activity standpoint, we also want to make sure we're hitting our 150 minutes of moderate or 75 of vigorous per week. Um, that's the general goal. So those are the physical activity guidelines and flexibility. If you have time and want to do it, that's fine. They recommend it. It's part of the guidelines, but I usually don't even include those because that's just not nearly as important. If you're like, hey, I have 30 minutes. Should I spend it stretching? Absolutely not. Do not do that. Go lift weights, go do something that gets you out of breath. Something like that is way better. But regardless, exercise is going to be very, very important and good for you regardless of the quote unquote success, right? So evidence does suggest that when you're on this therapy, these drugs, when it's accompanied by supervised exercise, then those who um, adhere to it, the adverse effects during treatment usually um, decrease. And then also it also um, helps after you stop the medication, right? So if you're exercising and you stop the medication, they have better results after that as well. And so really, once again, I'm a shill for big exercise. Uh, I'll admit it, you know, they're, they're sending me lots of money, but no, big exercise, exercise is the best thing you can probably do for your health. And it makes sense that why we want to do that as well. And, and really, as I was mentioning before, it really is a comprehensive obesity treatment, right? So the ideal way to lose weight is that we're going to do multiple modalities, right? It's not just one thing. The goal here is to reduce as much fat as possible while retaining muscle mass and hopefully minimizing obesity related complications. That's what we're going for. And so we're going to have taking those medications then we're going to be exercising specifically resistance training, doing cardiovascular training, all those things. So it's really, really kind of, um, a multi-pronged approach. And then on top of that, you know, in these studies, we did look at body composition. This is where we get this data from, right? So we looked at body composition 
And the gold standard, they use is DEXA or dual X-ray absorptimetry, which is a mouthful to say, so we say DEXA. You can use MRI as well, or you can use bioelectrical impedance. Um, all those are used. DEXA is kind of the gold standard in studies. MRI is probably the best, but so impractical because it's expensive and takes forever. And uh, bioelectrical impedance is pretty variable, and so that one depends on the device you have. But um, at the end of the day, this is not something we're, we're routinely doing in clinic. Um, you know, insurance won't pay for you to get a DEXA scan to see how you're doing for your muscle mass. So we're kind of just doing the eyeball test, right? Seeing, hey, how are you doing? Um, what does your muscle mass look like? Maybe hips are comfortable seeing how we're going, but most people aren't tracking the studies are. And that's why we're, the studies are doing this so that they can say, hey, um, when we see the weight loss, this is what we see. When we add on resistance training, this is what we see. So that's why we're taking this data that, hey, when we resistance train with weight loss, we tend to stave off some of that stuff. And so that's something that we think about. And they also have different muscle function tests they can look at, things like uh, grip strength or physical performance measures like the get up and go, sit to stand, lots of that stuff. So what they found though overall is that, hey, when you resistance train, the odds of you losing a lot more fat, it goes down. So we want you to resistance training. That's the big thing here. Get your protein intake. And going forward, there are definitely on, ongoing studies that are going to look at it. They're going to look at long-term effects of these medications on muscle mass and how to prevent muscle loss. That's really important. Um, also going to talk about potentially additional medications like androgen receptor modulators or myostatin inhibitors, which is a podcast for another time. Uh, but essentially, you could just not lose muscle by just taking another pill. And I mean, once again, we're getting crazy here, but that's what we're looking at. And um, But overall, we really want to just develop a balance for fat loss with muscle preservation while exploring, you know, what these medications are doing long-term to us. That's the big thing. And so overall key message here though, for this article is preserving muscle mass during these IMD therapy is critical to improving obesity treatment outcomes and uh, emphasizing protein intake and resistance training as core components of obesity management is, is really crucial. And of note, it was worth mentioning that this article was funded by two different pharmaceutical companies. Just want to mention that as well. I don't think it negates anything. They're saying, hey, if you're going to use our meds, if anything, they're saying, yeah, you're going to lose some muscle. And so they're kind of alerting things there. doesn't change the approach. Um, that's pretty consistent with what we find. So that's the first article here. I hope you found that helpful. And if you found this information helpful, then you might enjoy this next video that YouTube recommends as well.